Ja, meine Damen und Herren, ganz herzlich willkommen. Ladies and gentlemen, I would like to give you a cordial welcome here on this Monday afternoon event. You can choose the English translation if desired. There's a live button in Zoom and uh, activate that for the English interpretation and you're ready to go. I'm Tobias Häusler. In my real life, I'm a moderator and presenter for the uh, broadcaster WDR, the West German broadcaster, hence from North Red Westphalia. So there's a lot we touch as well, having to do with innovation, digitization, and transformation of the Ruhr area, which is part of the region. Okay, now let's get cracking and create some mood. I want to give you a quote. Let us assume the following. The EU with 27 member states and the cacophony of voices could live up and measure itself with the United States and China is a naive assumption. The CEO of the Deutsche Telekom said this, Mr. Tim Hotkes, and it was yesterday that he said that that was in the newspaper Welt am Sonntag. And he specified with regard to regulatory issues, we need a unified Europe and only that Europe will be in a position to gain strength and find its position. Indeed, uh, we are observing this in real life. The European Union and the European Commission are busy reforming and reshaping the digital uh, context and framework. So it's the first attempt to create rules, traffic rules, Digital Services Act, Digital Markets Act uh, are just a few buzzwords. Uh, and it's a very highly interested area where this also uh, applies, artificial intelligence. Yeah, we had a little bit of background noise, which is now overcome. We already live with artificial intelligence. It's a little bit the spirits we called up ourselves and now we can't get rid of them. And of course, we are also looking here at ethical questions. And we in Europe and we in Northern Westphalia might love spirits so much that we want to be here trailblazers in all things relating to AI. Let's have a discussion on it. We have wonderful experts we could uh, bring together for this event. And they told us we are happy to come here and our host uh, will soon have uh, the uh, floor. The Minister of North Westphalia for Economy, Innovation, Digitization and Energy. We are happy to see you, Minister Pinkwart. You have the floor. Yeah, Mr. Hoysler, glad to see you, Mrs. Hahn, Professor Rostalski, Mr. Gross. Ladies and gentlemen, I'm so delighted that we meet together on this exciting topic that is artificial intelligence, looking at it from a European perspective. I think Mr. Hoysler touched on it. Whatever you look at uh, coming as a publication from the European Commission and the European Union, it may touch on artificial intelligence. It's a must have. And also the European Parliament looked into this and there's even a special committee dealing with artificial intelligence. And the uh, recommendations take it up and the national strategies take it up. We have programs like Digital Europe that show uh, the importance of the topic and that we also need here funding. And that is envisaged. Mrs. von der Leyen, as Commission President, highlighted this also as one important element of the 100 days. And that uh, led us to the white paper. We have now received uh, the ideas of the commission, eagerly awaited, and we will discuss it with our guests. Mr. Gross, thank you very much for being willing to explain the ideas and proposals to us. Allow me to point out the following. 
With a risk-based uh, approach, the Commission has made the correct choice. To have a look at what categorization should apply with regard to risk and other questions will lead to very interesting discussion, not the least this afternoon. And I'm happy that there are uh, ideas to have regulatory sandboxes. And we will be very vigilant here because we do not want to create obstacles to innovation. We want to shape something that actually promotes innovation. And this without sacrificing our European values. These values must remain the light motif of our action. It's not just about um, blindly crashing ahead in order to keep abreast with the US and China. No, we should have our very own approach, our European pathway when shaping AI. In North Rhine Westphalia, we want to help along with this. And one thing is important for us. Our region is to become one of the 10 top sites for developing artificial intelligence. Science and research have a very great context uh, and good locations in our region. It's a highly developed industrial location. More and more startups we count in Northern Westphalia. There are high quality universities and uh, colleges um, that are busy in this area and also in the companies. So it's about bundling and strengthening existing activities. And in late 2018, we already established a dedicated competence platform in uh, this context, bringing together academia and the businesses. And we support other uh, initiatives like machine guided learning in the Rhine Ruhr area and an excellence uh, cluster in Eastern Westphalia, Lippe, part of our region. And we are happy to see a development of expertise and to promote and support the digital transformation with all our efforts. Ladies and gentlemen, dear colleagues uh, in the panel, thank you for being here as uh, partners in this discussions. I'm very interested in uh, hearing what the Commission can explain to us and our exchange. Dear experts, ladies and gentlemen, I wish to all of us an interesting exchange and now happy to give back the floor to Mr. Häusler. And thank you very, very much. Thank you, Minister. The Digital Services Act and the Digital Markets Act were mentioned. It was about looking at the platforms we are aware of that are in existence and how to regulate them, how to create some traffic lights. Now this is a step further, much more spectacular. It's about having traffic signs for uh, the participants, which are still unknown to some extent. We may put up traffic signs, but we are not so certain, is this a road that will be traveled? Uh, will something happen here? Will someone be coming? So we need a system with inherent flexibility. And we need to be vigilant. We need to monitor. It will need ongoing certification. Now, we have someone who really is here, the traveling salesman in this matter. We have seen you very often, and you are now head of unit um, in the Director General Connect, uh, part of the European Commission. It's about communication networks, contents, and technologies. And your area of uh, responsibility deals with artificial intelligence, policy development, and coordination. So it's good to listen to you, to have understanding insight, and then have an exchange. You have the floor, Mr. Gross. Mit Mikrofon ist es ein noch größerer Genuss. With microphone, in with your microphone, please. Noch hören wir Sie nicht.
I'm afraid we still can't hear you. Nein, noch ist nichts zu hören. No, I'm afraid we still can't hear you. Haben wir denn die Möglichkeit, unseren technischen Support Could we get some technical support, please? Could we get some support, please? Because otherwise the colleagues... Oh, well, if Mr. Gross were to speak, we'd hear him. No, I, I think he's trying the whole time, says the moderator. He's trying. He just can't get connected. <laughs> Sometimes it needs to be switched off and then on again. It might be something to do with the settings. It happens more often than you think. Well, perhaps somebody from the NRW office can uh, help us out here. I was talking to a tech guy earlier. No, I'm afraid that's still not working. Sonst schlage ich vor, schon mal unsere beiden Gespräche. So otherwise, then perhaps we could invite the other speakers to the floor and they can ask some questions. Well, I think that Mr. Gross is the uh, important person here today. He's got a tie on. Would be great if he had some time, some signed as well. I think he's uh, trying to get some help here. So let's move on. So Killian Gross, well, we'll hear from him soon. We'll hear about that uh, proposal that came out on the 21st of April very soon. So I'd like to start then by inviting two speakers, a member of the European Parliament, and she is the Renew Europe coordinator. And she is in that special committee on artificial intelligence, A. Hi, welcome, Svenja Han. Hi. And then we have another guest who is perfect as well, because, of course, she's going to help balance the debate. She's going to look at these opportunities offered by AI. So the opportunities available uh, and how it could be used in justice proceedings, for example. And then she's also going to mention the ethical side of things. So she has a PhD in philosophy and a PhD in law. And she uh, looks at criminal proceedings. And she's also a member of the ethic uh, board in Germany. And she looks at artificial intelligence. And she also is at the University of Cologne. So right in the region we're being hosted by. So welcome. Welcome, Frauke Rostelski. So, Mr. Gross, I'll just check again. Can you test your mic? Can we hear you yet? No, I'm afraid it's still not working. Okay, well, you were saying that it's not about uh, criticizing technology in one way or looking at trade opportunities. No, it's about the very key issues that lie at the heart of our society and how we're going to live together in the future. So that is fundamental. Yes, that's right. AI technology can have a significant impact in our society. So big, I'd say that it could have an impact on every aspect of life. And that's why we need to look at this very carefully. We need to think about how we want to shape our world in the future. And so that's why it's very important uh, to have this from the Commission. I think it's right that we approach and address the issue and that we uh, move from this abstract approach that we've had in the past. We've had many good papers on that, but I think it's important that we now move to a different level and look at the exact applications, look at the right, uh, the conditions that they would be using. And I think this is essential 
because I think when it comes to this kind of technology, it really is very cross-cutting. It can uh, be something we come across in every aspect of our lives. And I think it's something very nice as well. We have a lot of freedom here that we can get, but of course there are risks linked to freedoms as well. And so that's why we need to be very smart about the way in which we uh, shape things. And I think that this commission approach is a very important step here. And you said that you've been reading it very carefully. Did you see positive points? Were there things that surprised you? Did you see negative points? Well, yes, of course. That's a very uh, sensitive issue for a professor. I don't want to start to lecture you here. I just want to try and pick up on a few points that uh, struck me. Because we don't have so much time to talk about an 80 page document. So the minister just mentioned the risk based approach. That's something that we had in the text from the ethics board. It's something that the high level expert group mentioned as well. Now, of course, there are differences here when it comes to you look at the different kinds of risk level. But that's not the decisive thing at the end of the day. The important thing is that we have a risk based approach because we need to look at uh, what the effect will be. So you need to think about about the use of this application, but you also need to think about the risk and the impact that would have on citizens' freedoms. And if you try to relate those two things, then you need to try to get a good balance at the end of the day. We need to think about uh, the uh, demands that we can then set when it comes to these applications. And that's why I think that this risk-based approach is the right one. Uh, this is a horizontal kind of regulation as well. So it can be very uh, helpful if you're looking at liability in terms of products and so on, but basically a horizontal approach is the right approach because these technologies will affect different aspects of our lives in overlapping ways. So that's why we do need to uh, talk about this in a general way uh, initially. And then there's another uh, thing that I would say. You could ask many, many questions about all of the different details We'd hope to get some answers, but as a legal expert, as a lawyer myself, I would be looking at the application of AI in uh, criminal proceedings and in the justice systems. And I think that perhaps uh, it needed to be a bit uh, stricter here. So there is the technology compass, for example, that's a term that we know that has come to us from the US and it looks at the way in which you take these decisions. So you look at how the uh, sentence would be implemented, and then you also look at uh, how dangerous the situation would be. And so this is something that has been looked at in the USA, and they have seen that there has been bias and that uh, applies then to people who don't have a uh, white skin. So you need to look at how this would fit in with the fundamental rights that we are applying in the EU. And so there are a lot of question marks around this. And I think that we do need to look at it in more uh, detail. And I think that maybe uh, you might need to look at that list of banned technologies, not necessarily just high risk technologies. That's also an, ash an issue. So that is a question I had as well. I'm just wondering. If we're looking at where we encounter AI today, well, then maybe uh, we can also be looking at what the new research is and see uh, what impact that is happening. And I think we do need to look at what's happening worldwide. And there is a huge uh, challenge here. Mrs. Han, what about this cost benefit? and the impact that it has. So you're an FDP member, so that means that uh, maybe we might think that you would be suggesting that uh, Europe would do everything it can to make use of these opportunities, especially with North Rhine-Westphalia wanting to maximize on the opportunities as well. But what would you say here when it comes to the uh, suggestion that there could be a risk to citizens' rights? Well, yes, this is part of the discussion. The EU is really doing some pioneer work here. We really are the first who are trying to uh, draw a framework for artificial intelligence. And so we're trying to have this framework 
in which we'll move. And as we've just heard, we're talking about topics which would be acceptable, acceptable in society. And then we're talking about other areas where it might have an issue in terms of citizens' rights. And sometimes maybe you want to talk about a problem that doesn't exist yet. Um, but we do want to make sure that we're taking a leading role here. We want to have a clear framework, a streamlined framework for what happens in the future. And so that's why it's good that the Commission a text looks at the risk-based approach. So it looks at the use and the uh, proportionality here as well. And to look at the uses and not the technology. So maybe you're thinking it might be one example that you would block someone's phone if they're not wanting to wear a mask or, but then you also need to remember that there could be other issues when it comes to potentially affecting citizens' rights. And so this risk-based approach is one that's very much welcomed. It needs to be based on the facts. And then we also need to look at what it will be like in practice. Uh, we don't just want to have a lot of bureaucracy here. This is something that we're definitely looking at uh, in the parliament. And we also need to look at what works for small companies, not just large tech companies. And so that's going to be a very, very interesting part of the debate. And there are a few things that I feel a bit uneasy about. Well, yes, I can, I can see that whenever I type in SMEs and your name into Google, then I immediately uh, come across a press release because you were saying, yes, there are the users, the, are the benefits, and we don't want to have too much uh, bureaucracy. But then you're ringing the alarm bell about Article 50, and that's about the use of biometric data and facial recognition in public spaces. Uh, we're really looking forward to hearing from Mr. Gross here. Are you concerned about the effect? Well, okay, it's in it that it is basically banned, but it says that if there are exceptions from the scope, then actually it could be applied in a much broader way. So, for example, you want to uh, prevent some sort of risk or danger or your um, following criminal proceedings. Uh, it could then be used. It's not detailed in enough precision. And so it means that there could be different interpretations and applications of it. And that means it will be different in different places in Europe. We've got that when it comes to the definition of imminent danger, for example. And it also mentions a competent authority. Who is that? Is that some sort of authority, some sort of administration? And they can then uh, look at uh, giving authorization for use of biometric data at different stages. And so I don't think it was really uh, drafted very well. I think it just leaves the door open for a much greater use of biometric data. And I think that, yes, when you're looking at costs as well, well, we have heard from tests that there has been discrimination against minorities, people with darker skins, people who have been wrongly identified, and that is a big problem. We know that from one test use case in Berlin that that was what happened. And so I think that we now have a chance to uh, speak to Mr. Groves. At least we can hear that he's on the telephone. Uh, so it's uh, wonderful to hear your voice. So you basically, Mr. Gross, are the person who is on tour. You're presenting the paper. So I'd like to give you the floor. Welcome. I'm so sorry that we had here problems, uh, but OK, it's about artificial intelligence. I have now a little echo, says the speaker. Can you hear me now, asked the speaker? Yes, we can hear you very well. Okay, here we go, I think. 
We present the package on the 21st of April. That was a significant step for us. We did prep work, the high level group, the white paper, and it was important to have again the two pillars. We want to promote artificial intelligence because it can help us along with so many uh, usages. So we don't want to ban or forbid them um, because we're aware of the great potential of artificial intelligence. And I like to highlight this, and I mentioned here the coordinated plan. It's about 20 billion of public-private uh, investments over the next decade. And uh, we developed here a plan to do this together with the member states. And also about the following. Well, each technology is as good or bad as its applications. And uh, in the case of AI, we're aware that there are some more sensitive fields. And it's about having trust in artificial intelligence, trust among the citizens in Europe and among the businesses in Europe. And that is uh, where we uh, start with. Uh, and it's a framework that is also designed uh, to speed up the uptake of uh, AI. And the higher the level of trust, the more this will apply. It uh, may be a complicated and complex uh, framework. Let me highlight just a few important ideas. First of all, it's about future orientation. Not easy because there is such a speedy development uh, coming along with AI and we simply don't know what shape it will take in a few years. It's very dynamic. So we looked at the definitions and we also made a certain uh, following. We had a public uh, consultation with over 1,200 entries. It's about defining things in such a way that you have legal uh, certainty. So we did our level uh, best to be innovative in this regard. So various categories to be filled with uh, lists via delegated uh, legal acts uh, that um, are helpful to get active within the predefined legal framework. So which technologies are to be viewed as artificial intelligence, for example. So that is our approach in order to be fit for the future without being too vague. And we want to be horizontal. Well, the difficulty of uh, forecasting the development of AI touches on everybody and everyone. So it's about regulating a technology and not a sector. We used to come from a legal uh, approach. This is for this sector, this is for the other sector. So here we look at a technology that is found nearly everywhere from recruitment tool to medical applications and coming along with a very specific uh, challenge uh, because if there are damages, if there is a problem, uh, we have to have an answer to the question who is liable. That is a stringent problem to face. And the third aspect, risk as the basis. The majority of AI applications are no problem. Uh, the various filters, uh, uh, there are some multitude of applications that do not pose a problem, but they are critical applications where we need to regulate. Guided by facts, based on facts. That is the need. We presented here several uh, criteria and want to base ourselves on evidence that you find in the annex uh, where we elaborate on uh, this approach where we see a need for monitoring, for control. And we are guided by the principles guiding the internal market. Let's have a look before they're placed in the market because it needs to be a safe product, a secure product once it's placed in the market. And I think here, come back to my starting point. If we have a startup that develops a very sensitive uh, AI application, for example, where you could deal with uh, checking migrants, uh, then it must be presented in such a way that uh, the deployer or the authority using it can be convinced this is safe. This is our approach, uh, put in a nutshell, so to say. Maybe I can elaborate if so desired. Indeed, it's a wide field, uh, as we say in German. Maybe I can come back uh, to one question. 
How do you make certain the following happens? How can you know who is doing research on what? Uh, we use here the symbol of uh, traffic signs, uh, like driving under influence. <laughs> I'll give an example from that uh, field. Can you be aware of where research is uh, going, what they are doing? Can you monitor that? Can you observe that? Research is not in the scope of this regulation. We look at the products when they are close to getting into the market. Research is another area. Here we propose ethical principles to guide and orient our research uh, activities in the European Union. And, and that's nothing totally new. And uh, that is also the high level group. But once you have a product of AI placed in the market, then our regulation kicks in. And we want to leave a lot of flexibility and freedom to research, but we are looking here at the placing in the market. For example, AI on board of a car or as part of medical devices or a voice recognition tool, uh, when a decision has to be made, uh, who gets uh, medical treatment first when there is an emergency. So such a device, we look at it. Is it high risk? That's the first decision. And if it's an essential uh, part uh, of the device, then the whole device is high risk. And then the standalone uh, applications like a recruitment uh, tool or a, a CV uh, filter device uh, before you invite uh, someone for a job interview. There is a danger here uh, that you have here a bias, that there is some discrimination uh, kicking in uh, right at the starting point. Uh, so that many will not even be considered. So that needs clarification before that device or that application is placed in the market. And here we have our criteria. And we looked uh, around and uh, came up with eight categories. And we went a step further. We looked at the various applications. We identified them. We looked here at court cases, uh, motions, etc. And we should regulate what is indeed a problem. We cannot assume that might be a problem because that's very uh, problematic. You get also towards it with a dynamic element. We want to have it fit for the future what we propose so that we can adapt it easily to what is happening in the market. Uh, thank you. Now, I can imagine that the Commission has uh, had its own share of discussions, and now we are looking at the phase of the classical legislative propo uh, procedure. That will be a challenge, right? Yes, indeed, it will be a challenge. I think there are only two alternatives. You create a very abstract risk categorization put that in your regulation and you expect that the deployer, the user does its own understanding or maybe a, a court does that. We gave it serious thought a long time, but that's a very difficult approach. You may look at the criteria and you have a lot of literature out there on risk uh, categories. So in the end, it would mean that um, the deployer has to uh, define his own category or that uh, a court has to do it uh, afterwards. We thought it better that the legislator tries that. And these are not easy decisions. So we have several criteria. One is law enforcement. So the state, the public authorities is one example. But not everything that is part of the law enforcement field uh, is high risk. Uh, if, you, if you just deal with uh, the management of uh, dossiers, for example, of, of paperwork. So we have to be clear, where do we have the risk factor? And where do we have a use and deployment of artificial intelligence in such a way 
uh, that is essential or rather essential for the aspect we are looking at uh, as part of uh, uh, the powers of the state. Thank you very much for having added this. It's about details that we need to observe. Uh, and uh, I'm aware there is the ethical angle, of course, to consider. And we heard these are kind of regulatory sandboxes, and it's about exemptions. We will be very vigilant there, you said that, Minister. Indeed, uh, we want to be vigilant. We want to have as much uh, advanced clarification as possible, because uh, we are looking here also at individual uh, cases and we also desire a good level of agility, of flexibility to make certain that we are in a position to grasp the opportunities that will come along. Hence, the idea of these sandboxes. They are designed to serve as a framework for experimentation and for testing. And well, we have here a top-down regulation coming from uh, the European Union, but we also need a bottom-up uh, facility, so to say, because that enhances and enables creativity after all. So that is one thing I would desire. And a second desire I have when certifying artificial intelligence, uh, please give room to voluntary certification. Allow that, please. And the risk-based assessment should focus really on serious uh, areas uh, and serious cases. Because I want to give you here uh, the um, term of own responsibility that uh, needs to be allowed, uh, the own responsibility of the users and deployers. Mr. Gross, do you want to give a direct answer? Auf jeden Fall gerne. Das, aber ich möchte nicht den anderen Mitdiskutanten ich bin gleich ausführlich noch bei den, bei den, genau, bei den beiden äh, Mitdiskutantinnen. Yes, we'll get information. So, there were two important points there that the minister mentioned. The sandboxes. So these sandboxes are something that we think are very important because this was one of the concerns here. We wanted to think about how we could address risks without stifling innovation. That is the tricky balance that we've had. And it's a challenge for small companies in particular. The bigger companies, they have ways of managing costs and so on. And we were thinking that the costs for companies won't be so significant because they'll already be quite far through the process if they need to get to that quality management stage. And so the SME is not going to be uh, making something that hasn't been uh, checked and tested. So to be honest, we can't say that uh, we will just let the startups be uh, exempt from these uh, sandboxes because actually there could be huge implications from some of these applications. Uh, they might take off very, very quickly. And you can't just say that because the company running it was very small, it gets an exception from the requirements. Yes, we wanted to try to make things as simple as possible. So that's then why we have these uh, sandboxes. And so the uh, data authorities can be looking at them and there would be uh, support provided for certification. There could be lower uh, fees and so on. These are uh, important ways of perhaps speeding up the process. So that was something that was important for us. The voluntary certification, that's something that's allowed those voluntary codes are something that we still uh, allow and we didn't have fry uh, voluntary labeling because uh, we wanted to have a ce label we didn't want to create new additional labels because then that might uh, be more confusing for consumers mrs han you were saying that you were looking forward to hear mr gross speak because you learn something new every time he comes to a conference that was an point that was important for you 
And we know that you were talking about big players. We know that you were mentioning the uh, opportunities. Uh, we were thinking about these startups, these SMEs, and you saw lots of opportunities there for them. Well, our ambition needs to be to have good legislation that creates a good framework that then means European startups can become world leading companies. That should be what we want. It's not about uh, looking at just regulation. No, we want to look at the uh, industry policies, the economic side of it as well. But I also was saying that I was a bit uneasy about some of the uh, citizens' rights issues. Those are some of the issues I was concerned about. We were talking about surveillance and monitoring and social scoring. That wasn't uh, so clear to me. It was mentioned explicitly. So it was mentioned as something that would be banned. But actually, I'd have to say that I didn't see it as being explicitly banned. It was just a ban for the state. And so it's only a half a solution there. What happens with private uh, companies? So yes, it is a good basis, but we need to make it clear that we want to have a clear ban on social scoring. And then there is an overlap with other regulations, the GDPR, for example. And so I think when it comes to the citizens' rights perspective, I think that we still have some questions in the parliament and we'd like more clarity and we'd like to see some improvements. And I think that when it comes to the commercial side of things, well, I think, yes, we do want to look at the potential of AI. And I think that uh, the risk-based approach here is a very wise um, approach. Uh, Mrs. Frauke of Rostalski, I've listened to you many times and you were talking about AI. You were talking about the philosophical side of it, the psychological side of it, something that we don't always think about immediately. And you were talking about uh, people, so you and me, that we would trust our own skills less because the machines will teach us. So maybe this is something children will start to learn. Uh, they were uh, learning that the machines uh, do things better. And so at the end of the day, we might actually lose some of the skills that we have had in the past. Is this a dilemma that can't be resolved? Well, I think the important thing here is that we need to remember what we're looking at. And that's why I'm pleased to talk to Mr. Gross here directly and to raise this issue. And I think it's not looked at enough today. I think that um, if I look at my own professional experience, well, you might invite an expert for a certain case when it comes to uh, law. And you want to try and determine whether or not someone has a certain uh, illness. And there are a lot of borderline cases here. But you have the expert and they make a statement and then it can be very difficult for the judge to uh, stand back and just to make their own decision. But if you have technology, uh, the effect is even stronger. And uh, perhaps it's because there's something mysterious about it. There's a lot of things that we don't understand. And then you have the tendency maybe to interpret it as being something then that would be right. So you project this onto it. And then what I can see see is that yes, you build up the experience and you feel that uh, the right results are coming out. So we're looking at uh, diagnosis in, chem in clinics, for example, when it comes to cancer diagnoses. And uh, they're seeing that sometimes the diagnosis are uh, better and more accurate using the AI. And they're seeing this happen every day. They see that this technology is so good. And so, yes, they can see that they can use it. And perhaps they even have to use it because it improves their work. But on the other hand, uh, 
then because of this, maybe they will start to only rely on the technology and they won't notice if it might maybe make a mistake. And then there's another issue. We as people are uh, used to progress, but technology doesn't create the progress. It's we as people who create this progress. And so we actually need to build on what we have. We shouldn't let ourselves get worse. So that's about how we could solve that problem. And we don't have anything about that in the Commission proposal yet. We need to think about training methods. We need to think about making sure that people are aware that this is a problem that exists. And then we need to think about the people who use uh, AI and they need to be able to use their responsibility as well. And maybe uh, people need to be asked from time to time to take their own decision and not just to rely on the technology. And I think it's very, very important because this is very good technology that is being used. And I think there is a risk here that we could just stay where we are, but uh, we live and thrive on progress. And so that's a question here actually for Mr. Gross. You often talk about this. You talked about uh, trustworthy AI and that will be done through innovation friendly regulation is that enough no i don't think so i think that's what we're trying to resolve here but i'd like to respond briefly to what franco ruskowski just said yes you're right that is one of the basic problems here that's something that we were told many times especially when it came to the high risk level but that's when ai is not taking the decision it's just providing support so that's when it comes to justice or migration or asylum they're just support systems they are systems that help the uh, border officials for example to identify a language that is being used and to try and decide where that person probably comes from if they don't have any documents and it's just a support system it's just assistance at that high risk level and this is where i would agree with mrs rostowski when i've got this assistance then i trust it um if you are driving your car for example and you've got your um gps now and you follow it do you go and double check a map beforehand now no you know, if I have another document processing system and I, I use it, uh, am I going to go back and go through my 80 or 90 files again? Unless the system somehow starts giving me results that seem to be uh, nonsense. So this is the question here. How do you um, have this trustworthiness and the innovation? Well, what we are calling for is the oversight, and that means human control. So this is AI for people, not AI controlling people. And there are two elements here. So in a car or uh, a technical machine, then you've got a stop button. They have to be able to uh, take control over AI as a human. But then if you have AI in a social context, so for example, it's supporting a judge, well then from the very start, in the uh, instructions, it needs to be made very, very clear that this is just support and that they need to check. And this is important for the procedures as well. The decision maker needs to be in the position. They also need to have the time. So that depends on the number of cases, for example, that a judge needs to deal with every day. So they need to have the time to check everything case by case. So that's very important. And that is an aspect of human oversight. Minister Pinkwart, we already have artificial intelligence in our daily life, and we may not be aware of it. New products, new applications, new risks may really generate headlines, and uh, people may feel more and more insecure. What do you do? in order to convince people uh, to use uh, this technology. Thank you. It's indeed our observation. 
Very often, and we see it in our discussion, that uh, people are happy to take up new technologies if it makes life easier, if it speeds up things, if it's uh, helpful. And I think when we look at human development, we realize one thing. We have uh, increased our understanding and knowledge. Uh, we have also developed uh, further our educational system. And uh, I think we will manage uh, to do this correctly by putting more of uh, the topic that is artificial intelligence into our curricula in order to enable us. And the satnav uh, on board of your car. Well, if you look at it, you are aware that you have your certain level of freedom because you get a menu of uh, routes. Uh, you can choose the most economical route, the fastest, uh, the, the one with the nicest landscape to ponder, etc. You can choose. So you have here different levels of uh, freedom. And it's important that there is transparency coming along with this, that you can freely choose among the options given to you. Because this is about important uh, decisions. Well, uh, machine learning is now a buzzword, or information revealing your creditworthiness. Uh, let's not forget that the banks have been uh, taking up artificial intelligence as well for some time already. And the decision must be based not just on avalanches of data, but we need to use algorithms that are based on understanding and insight and uh, uh, that also take uh, into consideration the further implications. That is important if you want to make certain that there is still the human factor and the human decision maker in the end, if the human being is truly remaining at the center. If you want to achieve that, it requires that we get much more hands on with the topics. It's not just about adapting what we have. Uh, OK, wonderful. Uh, let's use it because it's a quicker processing of the x-rays. No, the doctor has to have a better, thorough understanding what's behind and what's implied when using this. Thank you. The more we have an uptake of this technology and the more we trust that technology, the more we need you, uh, Professor Rostalski. Uh, we uh, also have the question, how humanoid uh, can this technology come along? Uh, so what uh, can you say on that? Yes, the uh, man-machine interaction, that interface is a very interesting and important topic indeed. When you look at uh, care, uh, we are aware that it can be very positive uh, uh, to use a humanoid uh, robot or machine if, if it looks somewhat like a human being you're interacting with. But we also have to be careful of our societal nexus. Uh, it must not be allowed uh, that the machine is used and understood in such a way that you reduce your staffing levels because uh, the therapeutic little uh, seal can uh, make people happy. <laughs> so we have to define what are our guiding principles here. So it's the uh, factor of human contact, the contact between humans, that is always an overriding factor and should always have top priority when considering and deciding. Well, who knows what these therapeutic uh, robotic seals will still achieve. Yes, it's not manichaeism I'm preaching here. No, no, it's not pitting one against the other. It's about a wise, good uh, balance. And let's look at the US where they are a little bit uh, more active with this anyway. There are surveys and studies uh, looking at older uh, people, ladies in this case, um, who were given uh, a doll, uh, a robotic doll to, to fight uh, loneliness. Um, and then the grandchild was visiting and they looked at what happened. 
the old lady had lost interest in interacting with her grandchild because the doll was so fascinating. So th that's a pity, I think, and because you no longer can react to how a child really is, which can be sometimes a little bit <laughs> difficult. Uh, so let's focus also on that in order to maintain a human fabric. Thank you. Okay, what can you else say on the ideas proposed by the Commission? Uh, the risk-based uh, decision, so what is low risk uh, and what is high risk? Uh, lawn mowing device on the one hand and uh, social scoring on the other end. Uh, so what is needed and how quickly? It will be very exciting to see what uh, is about to happen. I think the Commission has embarked on a very sensible pathway and uh, it will be very interesting to see what the European Parliament will do and say because uh, there we have groups in the European Parliament uh, who actually desire a higher level of regulation. I'm aware of colleagues from the left uh, political uh, sphere who say, okay, this is very risky, uh, far too uh, high the risk, etc. So, so it will be very interesting to observe uh, happenings inside the European Parliament. Focus has to be the following. Let's try and achieve European solutions. That is an absolute must. Uh, this is important also for our internal market. And if Europe is to be an innovation hub, uh, uh, then we need to approach it in the correct way with these new technologies. Another important question. What happens if there is abuse and misuse of digital technologies? I think we touched on this aspect several times already. And what happens if there is uh, a damage uh, taking place? So it's about the consumer, how to protect the consumer. And another important aspect is also the following. We as Europe in the global context, what will be our positioning between countries and regions that uh, don't think very highly on of uh, human rights, China being just one example, or if we compare how the US handle all this. What needs to happen to make certain that our ideas uh, are ideas and a framework that also sets a little bit uh, an example globally and, and has a bit of a pull effect. Wonderful. This is uh, the right moment uh, to give the floor to Mr. Gross once again and then uh, to the minister. And we also read from our participants. Uh, global standards, global ethical standards. Do we want to go for that? For example, European companies uh, are active in the market in China with regard to facial recognition. So can we talk about global worldwide standards? Thanks for asking the question. That is our goal. Our intention is not to block off the European market. Uh, that would not be helpful. We invite partners to be part of our effort. And we are also very active internationally uh, in the context of OECD, for example. We also have a dialogue uh, with the Biden administration in the USA. That administration is now a little bit more open. And uh, let me mention you the uh, general data protection uh, regulation, GDPR, which has set a little bit the example for the rest of the world now as well. So if you come from a third country, etc., if you want to put your product in the European market, you have to play by the European market rules. And that's what we are establishing. And we are having here also an exchange uh, with our partners to have standards that are either the same or very similar. We invite them to come along with us, uh, uh, with our uh, standards. Uh, that would be the ideal, obviously. 
And I think there's a future in this because the European market has a good size and has a significant importance uh, that invites others to adapt uh, to that market. Professor Pinkward, final remarks, uh, but uh, it's just 4 p.m. You can now decide uh, what delay you want to, to uh, take uh, on for your next uh, commitment. A globally leading role in AI for Europe. Um, what is your opinion on this also when you think of North Rhine-Westphalia in that context? Minister, please activate your microphone. I hope now you can hear me. Fantastic. Thank you, Mr. Häusler. Thank you, dear guests, Mr. Gross, Ms. Hahn, Ms. Rostalski. Thank you for having been part of this interesting exchange. It was interesting for me, I hope also interesting for our guests and our attendees. And Mr. Häusler, once again, you gave an important uh, contribution towards the success of this. It was very dynamic and very interactive. It's a very exciting topic and it warrants our being vigilant and observing what's happening. I'm happy to see the Commission having put the topic on the agenda. And we desire a framework indeed, but a framework with the right degree of flexibility to shape uh, things. Uh, to uh, the uh, member countries, uh, to the regions, uh, so that uh, we can move uh, within a framework with guiding principles uh, that allows us to move in between with flexibility. That's important in order to uh, move ahead. And we are aware that was obvious in the discussion, we need a certain openness to what still may develop. And something that uh, came during the discussion. So there are all kinds of opinions out there, AI and, and robots and humanoid robots uh, and all that. I'm a fan of the following understanding. Digitization must help us people to have uh, further development uh, as well. And if you want to be self-critical, it means the following. We are not yet perfect. We are not yet perfect with our own assessments and evaluations. I mean, you look at the medical field and the judicial field, etc. we still face one problem, namely, a lot of our decisions are based on past experiences. And they can be very diverse and come from very diverse backgrounds. So, we have our empirical baggage, so to say. And even if you have a high level of experience, that is limited uh, background. So, as a human being, we are not perfect, certainly not in such a dynamic world as we observe right now. So, we always require technical assistance, we always require help. And here, AI, we have a wonderful tool in order to really operate in the digital context and to have our own uh, development in that context. And uh, it's about having the following view. This is a wonderful opportunity to help us with improving our own decision-making process. What it requires is a sober, correct uh, understanding of what AI is and what it is about. Uh, and thank you uh, for uh, allowing also an optimistic outlook with regard to Europe and its future in a digital context, uh, in our daily life, in our business life, uh, with full respect of our foundational and fundamental rights, which will not be harmed by all this. Thank you very much as well. Indeed, we could uh, have an exchange over hours right now, and it will be a topic that will remain with us for years to come. And uh, a lot of digitization is still awaiting us out there in the future. Thanks to all. And I see that uh, uh, many remained until this very moment. Thank you and see you again. <laughs>